Heather McDonald is a phenomenon, a longtime essayist and author, a senior writer at the Manhattan Institute, and a lot more. She has always been an effective and eloquent advocate, debater, and public speaker for the police and law enforcement, the rule of law, and common sense race relations. So of course the left hates her because she's shamelessly honest on all fronts. With that probably inadequate introduction, I will attempt here to summarize and highlight her 4,000 word plus discussion on the Neely Penny struggle on the F train in Manhattan and her analysis of the culture, street, and racial problems that brought us to this point of conflict and legal insanity. She begins, quote, Neely died on May 1st on a New York City subway car after being restrained by a Marine veteran who was trying to protect his fellow passengers from Neely's psychotic outbursts. Neely has been turned into a symbol of a racist system of law enforcement and of civilian values that exaggerate the threat of mentally ill vagrants to keep minorities down. All the pathologies affecting American citizens were present in that earlier fatal encounter and its aftermath. The grotesque parody of compassion that is conventional homeless policy, government's elevation of the supposed interests of the antisocial and dysfunctional over those of the law-abiding and hard-working, anti-white race-baiting and racial pathos. But the May 1st confrontation between the ex-Marine Daniel Penny and the mentally ill Neely stands for more than failed policy. Reaction to Penny's intervention illuminates as well the war on manly virtues and their attempted replacement with an emasculated dependence on bureaucrats and social workers. Okay, so altogether way too common, Neely was yet another crazed and violent man who had a long rap sheet including his forte, violent assaults on elderly women. Now, as truly disgusting as that is, what we need to keep in mind here and not let the powers that be force the conversation away from is the daily landscape these people are dealing with in these huge leftist cities in general. I'm going to go ahead and assume that most you folks aren't sitting in some cramped apartment in a downtown metropolis. And so, to paint the picture of what these people are going through, how many times have you seen a video clip on social media of a completely random, horrible, merciless assault on someone, usually white or Asian, usually female, in a subway or on a big American city street or waiting on an elevator in a big apartment complex. Lately, the talking heads like to reference the people getting pushed in front of the trains. And as disgusting and insane as that truly is, these random split-second assaults are far worse on the mind of average tax-paying law-abiding citizens because the threat doesn't go away once you enter the train itself or hit the stairs out of the subway. It's there until you lock that fourth deadbolt and drop your keys on the way in the door. So I guess, before I move on, my original point is that lawlessness is everywhere. And for anyone to be expected to sit there measured and considerate of proper technique on restraining a nasty, violent zombie is beyond ridiculous. And just further points out that these people running these cities, these Democrats are not serious at all, not even a little bit. And the ones that are, they want the violence. They want the death in these streets, full stop. Heather continues, quote, while vagrants have a right to shelter, they have no obligation to use it. They are free to continue colonizing public and private spaces if they prefer. An army of feckless outreach workers pads around after the vagrants, politely inquiring as to whether this time they might deign to accept services and shelter. In early April, several outreach workers had come across Neely in a subway car at Coney Island. He was flashing his genitals and urinating on the floor. Miss McDonald's provides much more. She describes the May 1st arrival of Neely, the well-known time bomb, after he no doubt jumped a turnstile and showed up in an F-train car. She continues, quote, At the Lafayette and Broadway station in Manhattan, Soho, he threw his jacket on the floor and screamed that he was hungry, thirsty, and willing to die. 
There were various versions about what he actually said. The Daily Mail reports a third version from another eyewitness, quote, I will kill a mother effer. I don't care. I'll take a bullet. I'll go to jail, unquote. Well, here's what Penny, a Marine, you know, once a Marine, always a Marine, actually did. Quote, Penny and his fellow Good Samaritans held Neely down for several minutes and then rolled him over on his side in a recovery position. The video does not suggest that Neely was in a chokehold during that entire time. A chokehold applies pressure to the carotid arteries in the neck to induce temporary unconsciousness. Rather, Penny appeared to be restraining Neely with a bear hug until the police could arrive." Unquote. Derek Chauvin didn't strangle or asphyxiate George Floyd either, but the racialist mob and the loudmouths and the media blew the thing up in the Chauvin-Floyd case calling the prone restraint an asphyxiation murder hold, and in the Penny Neely matter, a choke murder hold. Pretty simple process of mob justice. Yell and repeat murder and choke hold and people go to jail for life. Anyways, Miss McDonald commented on the calm and impassive nature of the accused Penny. I would also point out that Neely was similarly obviously not struggling in the headlock like a man being strangled to death. George Floyd died of a cardiac arrest because of excitement and a very very bad heart, a load of fentanyl and methamphetamine, not being restrained on his stomach. The widely used prone restraint taught to Minneapolis police officers and parts of department policy that killed St. George is not a killer. It was his heart. George Floyd died of a cardiac arrest, not asphyxiation. Now we have to put up with another scared, terrified medical examiner who will declare Neely a victim of homicide by strangulation. The lesson they want you to learn here is obvious. White boy, don't lay a hand on an oppressed minority person. He or she might die and you will be prosecuted as a white supremacist murderer. Conviction assured in a big blue city in America. Once again, I know what a chokehold is, and Penny did not have a chokehold on Neely. He had a headlock, with no evidence on the video of the key element of a chokehold. The right hand and arm were not in the lever crank position for a chokehold. One more time, just look at the video. Penny isn't cranking on a chokehold. He was holding the man's head to restrain him. Chauvin was not bearing down to asphyxiate a 224-pound man. He was at 170 pounds with gear added, not capable of asphyxiating George Floyd. Floyd and Neely both died of cardiac arrest from excitement and exertion, and that could have been aggravated by drugs on board. People die suddenly and quietly, sometimes just dropping to the ground when they have a cardiac rhythm disturbance. In modern-day blue cities, racist social justice prosecutors, the DA, applies the Red Queen approach from Alice in Wonderland. Sentence first, verdict afterwards. The prosecutors are ready to trash the innocent till proven guilty principles as prosecutors run their updated and politically correct version of lynching by unethical, politically motivated government prosecutors. Miss McDonald details the performances of race hustlers and poser academics and professionals who jumped to the microphone. Then she discusses how we got to this point, and I have covered it extensively through the years and assure you, her narratives are accurate and just dead on. Quote, this status quo is the result of two upheavals in social policy, one regarding mental illness, the other regarding the proper focus of the government. Civil libertarian Thomas Souza's argued in the 1960s that mental illness was an arbitrary concept designed to snuff out non-conformity to bourgeois norms of behavior. While Sousa's deconstruction of the distinction between sanity and insanity was not widely embraced to its full radical extent, he did succeed in making the standard for long-term and voluntary commitment nearly impossible to meet. Mental institutions were shut down and their inhabitants released to, quote, the community 
a movement aided by those facilities' high costs and sometimes inhumane conditions. All this for the privilege of walking around with feces in one's pants while raving at demons and ghosts. So I guess, really, if it weren't for politics, the deinstitutionalization movement could not have survived a short experiment, but it continues still to this day. Heather McDonald asks, quote, Meanwhile, hardworking taxpayers are treated simply as ATMs for funding the rights, revolution rights as in civil rights. When government abdicates its responsibility to maintain public safety, a few citizens, for now at least, will step into the breach. Penny was one of them. He restrained Neely, not out of racism or malice, but to protect his fellow passengers. He was showing classically male virtues, chivalry, courage, and initiative. A homicide charge is the most effective way to discourage such initiative in the future. Stigma is another, unquote. Miss McDonald brings us the benefit of her research, quote, contrary to the anti-white narrative, white on black homicides are almost non-existent. Black folks commit 87% of all non-lethal interracial violence. Between blacks and whites and whites and blacks, blacks are roughly 35 times more likely to commit violent offenses against whites than whites are to commit violent offenses against blacks. Existing while black is more dangerous than existing while white, but not because of white supremacy. In the first 18 months of the pandemic, black juveniles were shot at a hundred times the rate of white juveniles. That shooting spike began only after the George Floyd race riots. Had any of those black juvenile gun victims been shot or killed by whites, we would have heard all about it. Of course, instead, the rule for deciphering criminal reports is as follows. If the race of a crime suspect is not provided, that suspect is black. The rule applies when the victim is black and even more so when the victim is white. Now, if a crime suspect is white, however, that fact will usually be reported and it will always be the lead in any story in the rare instance where the victim is black. In closing, Miss McDonald is a genius and a second to none analyst of the current social scene and domestic political environment with particular expertise in matters of law enforcement and inner city crime. I will keep you posted on the ridiculous trials and tribulations that ex-Marine Daniel Penny is being put through. In the meantime, should go without saying, don't stop protecting your fellow citizens when given the opportunity. Heather McDonald knows a lot about this topic. She's written about policing for many years. She's the author of an upcoming book called When Race Trumps Merit. She joins us tonight to assess. Heather McDonald, thank you so much for coming on. This is the tragedy, this is one of them, that you predicted, I think. How would you assess what we saw in Memphis? Well, this makes me long for the days, Tucker, when we heard ad nauseum from academia that blacks cannot be racist because racism equals power plus privilege, and blacks, by definition, have neither of them. Now we're at the point where racism is a virtually non-falsifiable proposition. My, my favorite example of this new paradigm is the claim that the fact that the five officers in Memphis were indicted for murder is itself a product of racism. So, you know, what's an ally to do? The only thing you can do is absolve favored victim groups of all accountability. But the larger point is that the post-George Floyd horrors never stop coming. Uh, we lost thousands more black lives to, to drive-by shootings. Not a single one of those protested by Black Lives Matter activists. And police departments are now facing a retention and recruitment crisis at the same time that the pressure is escalating yet again to hire by race, uh, pressure that began under the Obama administration and even was more longstanding. Well, letting race trump merit is always a disaster, whether it's in policing or in medical training. And uh, the, pr the premise for this, this diversity hiring is not even true. It is not the case that the more black officers you have on a force, the less excessive force or brutality you have. The Obama administration itself found that in Philadelphia, 
black and Hispanic officers were more likely to shoot unarmed blacks than white officers. A 2017 study found that the more black officers on a force, the more black civilians were killed. So this whole story, the narrative of police racism and the narrative that getting rid of standards will solve our crime or policing problems is completely false and it's going to get worse. Most of this came by way of the American Thinker. If you liked it, hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't. Leave a comment down below. There's a PayPal link in the description box, so please put a dollar in the bucket on the way out the door. I'd like to thank everyone for all your donations. They're much needed and much appreciated. Now, with all that being said, we'll see you next time. Oh. Come on, move. Move. Easy, easy. Ah!